All right, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to be in the last chapter before the first exam. So next week, don't anyone to miss this. Next week, Thursday. Wednesday. That's right. I can't keep track of days. Wednesday. I'm deaf, so. Wednesday. Wednesday. Exam. Okay. Next Wednesday. Thank you. Not this Wednesday. <laughs> this is the final yeah. chapter of content before the first exam. So, okay. yeah. So, um, before we get started with this chapter, though, there was something that I forgot to mention at the end of the last lecture, which was after talking about cis and trans on cyclohexanes, is that you need to, when naming them, if you're asked to unambiguously name a structure, this. Is not the same thing as this because, in this case, well, these are cyclohexanols. Um, this is a trans <laughs> one, two, three, four methyl cyclohexanol, and this is a cis. So if you're asked to unambiguously name a system which has the possibility of being either cis or trans, you need to specify which it is. So when we're dealing with stereoisomers, and we're about to go down that rabbit hole um, a lot, because this is our easiest scenario of um, isomerism. We're going to be getting a little more complex starting today. So. Make sure you get in the habit of identifying stereoisomers and including it in part of the name. Uh, okay. So, starting off on chapter four, isomers. And what an isomer is, is it's just a spatial arrangement of an atom. So, And the easiest is constitutional isomer. And constitutional isomer is when you actually need to break and reform new bonds, but the number of atoms are the same. The types of atoms are the same. So the formula is the same, but the way that they're assembled <coughs> is not the same. Um, so a good example, let's say we've got Ethanol, we've got two carbons, six protons, and an oxygen. We could also have dimethyl ether, which has two carbons, six hydrogens, and an oxygen. So it has the same number and types of atoms, but the way that they're assembled make them unique compounds. So these are constitutional isomers. And these are really easy to identify, right? Almost all of the uh, nuance of this is in stereoisomers. <laughs> and so what a stereoisomer is, is it has all the same fundamental connections, except that they differ in how they're arranged spatially. So a couple variations on how they can be arranged spatially, which makes them stereoisomers. Uh, we've already covered cis-trans variations. But this is limited inherently because for something to be cis or trans, you can only have two groups around a rigid system. Right? Uh, the minute you've got a third group, what is cis to what? What is trans to what? If you have This compound is it cis or trans? Indeterminate? Yeah, it's indeterminate. Because 
this would be trans to this, but this is cis to this, and this is trans to this. But that's so that doesn't help us much in terms of nomenclature. Because then you add a fourth group and you add an extra layer of complexity. So it'd be you'd have to write a small paragraph to describe what's cis to what and what's trans to what. So that doesn't work um, once we get a little bit more complex. Um, there are two different types of scenarios, but we'll start with cis trans here. Let's do the two different types of cis trans real fast, and then we'll move into our more complex <coughs> scenarios. So cis, uh, cis and trans can be around any rigid system where you don't have freedom of rotation. So that comes into two general categories. Scenarios where you have rings and scenarios where you have double bonds. So if we have a ring structure, we can have something like this, where the methyl groups are on opposite sides of the plane of the cyclohexane. And we know that if we were to do this as a chair structure, this would be on top, this would be on bottom, so we would draw it like this. And we still have this visible plane that we're referring to, which is the plane that we've drawn it in the board here. So that's this one would be up like this, this one would be down. And so either way, we would say that this is trans. Now, if this were to be on the same side of the ring, whether on the top side or the bottom <laughs> side, these could both be dashed wedges, and that would be fine too. Those would both indicate that you'd have cis. And in that case, it would look like this. So this is for any ring system. It could happen for cyclohexane, cyclopentane, cyclobutane, any non-rotating system works. And another example of that is double bonds. So remember that double bonds don't have freedom of rotation because the p orbitals have to be aligned very, very, very closely so that they can share electrons across those p orbitals. And if you were to twist that bond, you'd unalign the p orbitals, you couldn't <coughs> share those electrons and you'd no longer have a second bond. So to function to twist a double bond requires breaking the pi bond. Um, and that takes a lot of energy. So we call it a rigid bond. And there's two ways we can look at this. If we've got something like this, where we put substituents matters because we don't have the ability to rotate here. So if you put a methyl here and a methyl here, These methyls are trans to one another. And if we have methyls on the same side, they stay on the same side, and that makes these cis. And these have unique chemical properties. These are not the same compound. So we have to name them ambiguously as cis or trans. But let's see what happens if we make this a little bit more interesting. Let's say we've got an alkene that looks like this. We've got a pair of alkenes here, same number and types of nuclei, fundamentally attached in the same order. So this chlorine and this methyl are attached to the same carbon. It's just how they're arranged spatially that's different because we can't just take this and flip it over as if this was a single bond. 
So how do we describe this? We can't really say cis or trans because the methyl would be trans to the bromine, but the chlorine would be cis to the bromine, but the hydrogen is cis to exists silly, right? So what we do is we need to start ranking these in terms of prioritization. And then from that ranking scheme, we'll be able to have a couple different approaches to how we can specify which stereoisomer is which. So generally, this is good. we're going to use the easy system for scenarios like this. And I know it sounds like I said easy, but it's the E Z system. Um, and it's this one's actually once you get used to the rules associated with prioritizing different groups, it's actually pretty easy. So what we do is we rank everything. I'll give you the big picture here first. So we have two scenarios here. After ranking, you've got a scenario where on either side of the double bond, you have one that will be lower priority and one that will be higher priority and one that will be higher priority and one that will be lower priority. And we'll get into the rules for this in a second. And depending on the orientation of the high and low priorities, so it can look like this as well. Either the high priorities and low priorities can be paired on the same side, like this, or they can be on opposite sides. And I have a little trick for understanding which one is which. This is called the Z conformation, and this is the E conformation. And the easiest way to remember that is that these are on Z same side, and these are not on the Z same side. So we default to whatever is not Z same side, which is E. Um, yeah, so this one's super easy. You, if you ever forget this while still in OCHEM, you must feel enormous amounts of shame. <laughs> because it really is super, of all the things to forget, this is not one of them. Um, I'm not going to say that about many things in OCHEM, but the easy system is pretty straightforward. So let's talk about how we prioritize these groups really fast. Um, let me get rid of this. First rule, greater atomic number has higher priority. So in this case, on the left side of the double bond, we have a bromine, we have a hydrogen. Right out the gate, bromine has a higher atomic number. This is going to have our higher priority. Over here we got a chlorine and a carbon. Chlorine has higher atomic number than carbon, so this one will have higher priority. So you don't have to go any further down the list if you have distinctions based on atomic numbers. You rank them. We see these are not on the same side, therefore it must be E. So this would be the E stereoisomer. But there are a few more rules. If it's a tie, you move downstream. I'm going to word this differently than the book did. What you do is you move one bond away sequentially until you find a difference in atomic number. That's all this is. 
And I've seen some really funky ways to describe this that make it much more complex than it needs to be. As long as you stay one bond at a time until you see a difference, and then you immediately go with that difference that has the higher atomic number. You don't go any further. What happens further than that doesn't matter. If everything preceding that change is, or that difference is the same, and you encounter that first difference, that's it. So let's look at this side on the left. We go one bond away, and that gives us bound to carbon. Bound to carbon. OK, the same. So we're going to examine the other bonds. This carbon, let me actually just draw it in. So this first carbon is the same. It has a hydrogen and a hydrogen, the same. Another hydrogen and another hydrogen, the same. This one has a third bond to a chlorine. This one's third bond to another carbon. This one, it's prioritization. Let's look at this one. This one's actually kind of fun. Um, because this one's a little bit more nuanced. Let's see here. We've got a carbon with two hydrogens and an oxygen, and here we have a carbon with two carbons and a hydrogen. Which of these has the nuclei which is the largest? So we're not going to add them up and take the atomic weights and say, well, two carbons plus, so that's two times 12 plus one, and here we have 35, it wouldn't matter anyway, 35.45 plus two, so that's 37.45. We're not doing that. Or excuse me, there's an oxygen here. So it would actually exceed it. Which one's bigger, oxygen or carbon? Oxygen, so this one gets prioritization. But isn't the top one, the top carbon bonded to two carbons? And it is, but this one is bound to an oxygen and two hydrogens. And we're not going to look at the sum of the three bonds. It's in that system to that carbon, which one has a larger, yeah, exactly. This one? It wouldn't matter. No, I, I know. I was misremembering. Oh, OK. Good. Thanks. No sweat. And then the third rule is what do we do with multiple bonds? I guess that's not a rule. It's a question. Uh, but we'll talk about it here. For every bond that you see, we just treat it like an additional single bond of the same type. So if we see something like this, this is the same thing functionally as if we saw this. You can take each of these bonds and say this carbon is bound to what would be considered the equivalent of a hydrogen and a carbon and a carbon. So if you're in a scenario where this is A and C, two carbons, like this. Oh. There we go. Here, our first bond is to carbon. So then we have to evaluate what do these two carbons have bound as their additional three bonds, because the first bond back is already counted for. This one has a hydrogen and two carbons. This one has two hydrogens and a carbon. In that particular scenario, the difference is going to be the one which has the two carbons bound to it instead of the one carbon bound to it. Because we can say there's no difference here, 
Let me just draw this out explicitly. There's no difference in that first one. There's no difference in one of these, but in the remaining third bond, before we move further downstream, we've identified a difference where one has a higher atomic number than the other. Uh, let me do another example of that. Well, I just did it. So, if to determine this is E or Z, we'll divide this in half. Look at this side, then look at that side. This side. This carbon, this carbon, is there a difference? This one has what bound to it? HHC. This one has HHC. So there's no difference with this carbon. We need to move another bond away. So now we're at this carbon and this carbon. This one has CCC. This one has H H O, which one gets priority? O. So this is going to be our higher priority group. Over here, we just did it. Um, this carbon and this carbon. This carbon has H H C. This carbon has H C C. So there is a difference where one nuclei is larger than another. This one gets priority. These are not on the same side. Therefore, it would be labeled E. <laughs> now, we haven't gotten into alkynes and alkenes yet, so I'm not going to do, do the whole shebang. When, once we get into alkenes and alkyne nomenclature, we could name it. Could you do like a template of how you can insert the E into the name? At the front. It's just, is it parentheses or is it just the E with a hyphen? It depends on the number of, um, for something like this, it would just be. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to overcomplicate it yet. Let's see here. Now, this one's pretty easy. This is not the one that gives people fits. We're going to do the one that gives people fits now. Everyone's like, yay, Monday. I'm good at having fits on Monday. <laughs> My three-year-old slept in today. We went to wake him up. And he was like, no up, please. No <laughs> up, please. <laughs> As he's like trying to fight us off. <laughs> he's already a good college student. Right? I know. I know. I don't know, actually. I never actually got out of college, so I wouldn't know what it's like to not be institutionalized. Um, you're doomed. Yeah, so watch out. Um, the, uh, I realized when I finished my PhD that I'd gone to college for 13 years. So I was in college longer than I was in the public school system. And that was, at that point, I knew something was weird. Um, and then I was like, well, what are you going to do next? Uh -huh. More stay. <laughs> right? That's what everyone does. So let that be a warning. Get out while you can. Finish. Wait, let me. Finish and get out while you can. <laughs> <laughs> Don't just get out. <laughs> oh, we can't just start that. Yeah. So. <sighs> We're going to talk about enantiomers first. So, an, what an enantiomer is, 
is it is a stereo isomer where you have non superimposable mirror image. So this is a, a pair of enantiomers where you have two structures that have all the general same connectivities, but they're arranged spatially so that the mirror images, because they're a mirror image of one another, are not superimposable. And we're going to get into that in uh, pretty good detail here. Um, and there's a characteristic of these compounds. When something has a non-superimposable image, when it's an enantiomer, it means that it's chiral. So chirality is going to be a term which uh, describes a similarity in physical and chemical properties, although you have everything attached the same way. So let's see here. The book goes, I like the way the book does it, but I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle. If we have some compound Let's see here. Uh, we'll go with, OK, just some general groups, A, X, Y, and Z. If I put a mirror, if this was looking in the mirror, it's like mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the most chiral of them all? Um, <laughs> what you see in a mirror is what's closest to the mirror, but the side doesn't change. So what this would see in the mirror is a stays vertical and centered. Y is still out away from plane, but down, and near the mirror. Z is into plane and down and near the mirror. And then X is still in plane, but away. This is how we draw any generic mirror image, is you just put up a plane, and so, so if someone said, hey, draw the mirror of an image of this compound, it's not that tricky. You just have to make sure you keep everything out that's out, everything back that's back, and reverse it so everything's close to the mirror on both sides or distant from the mirror on both sides. Now, let's do an exercise where what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, I'm going to rotate around this bond and take the whole bottom and spin it 180 degrees. like this. So I'm going to put the x over here. And we're rotating around this axis, running through this carbon to A bond. And then when I do this, the y is going to be 180 degrees over here, and z is going to be up front. And immediately what we see is that A is in the same position, x is in the same position, but what we've done is we flipped y and z by taking the mirror image. And here's the really neat thing. We're just going to go right to the rule instead of leading up to it. If you have four different groups attached to a central atom, it's going to be chiral, meaning the mirror image will not be superimposable. There is no way, if you take a mirror image of something <coughs> which has four things attached to it and all four of them are different, that you can spatially spin it in any way that superimposes. A really good example is handedness. Right? So we've got left hand, right hand, mirror images, functionally. There's no way that I can superimpose these so they're spatially the same. So we actually refer to these kind of structures as uh, handedness occasionally because of that. Now, four different groups means it's going the mirror image is going to be non-superimposable. Let's do a little uh, test of theory here and see what happens if we have three different groups. Let's. Uh, we'll just, yeah. Let's say we just put a 
pair of Z's there. Well, when we spin it, that means that this will also be a Z. Or take the mirror image, excuse me. And when we spin it, this will be Z, and this will be Z. And all four positions are the same. So this is a very simple way to show that you can superimpose this mirror image. Sometimes you have to do rotate around different bonds to show that it's superimposable. But if you have all of the same things, let's say it's methane, that's achiral. Oh, achiral means not chiral. If I add one unique group, the mirror image will still be superimposable. If I add two unique groups, super image will still be superimposable until we make four different groups. It will be a chiral. This has four different groups, so this will be chiral. And the mirror image of this, if we were to do this, this compound and this compound would be a pair of enantiomers in terms of our reference. Some other terminology. The central atom, in this case, is referred to as a chiral carbon. These are also called stereogenic centers. Not on that one, though, right? or stereo centers. You know, the reality is there's a little nuance to it that the book goes into, but people use it interchangeably. If you refer to something as a stereo center, they're going to know exactly I what you're talking because about. that one was a chiral. This carbon? That one's chiral. That Because oh. we, have, we have four different groups. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. It was, then I changed it. Yeah, then I changed it. <laughs> all right. Ah. It's... You got to stay on your toes. Right. I'm changing things all the time. Are uh, stereo centers always not always, but because carbon likes to have four bonds to it, it's the one you're going to see. Um, like oxygen likes to have two bonds with two lone pairs, so you're not going to see four distinct groups on oxygen. You're not going to see it on nitrogen very often. We're going to have some scenarios with sulfur and phosphorus, but um, overwhelmingly we're going to see it with carbon. So how on earth do we name these? Cis and cis trans. This certainly isn't easy, or E Z. It's not that bad though. So let's go into um, how we do this. And there's, I'm going to do the approach that's in the book, which is the approach that's in every book. And then I'm going to show you a trick which will save you some time that I've learned when I was an undergrad, but it, I've never seen it in a book before. And then you, via practice, can determine which one you prefer. OK, so the cool thing about having this ranking system, we're going to use ranking system, which is not EZ, it's RS. And R stands for rectus, S stands for sinister because left-handed people are not to be trusted. So this is Latin for right and left. That's actually the root of sinister is, um, yeah. Anyway, because I don't know why people, left-handed people, got that reputation. But history can't be completely wrong. So you're like, so. you don't know what side there's 
Right, except that depends on the culture because in Japan, all samurai were trained to be right-handed swordsmen, regardless of their handedness. There's an old phrase that there's no left-handed samurai. Um, so, and in terms of eye dominance, it's the same way because fighter jet pilots have one type of headset. So if you have cross eye dominance or you're wrong eye dominant, you have to train your brain to read things with the other eye under certain scenarios to be dominant. Very adaptable. Yeah. Oh, here we go. So RS. No more Latin. This is chemistry. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at all four groups. We're going to assign them a ranking. The ranking system is going to be identical to the ranking system we just did for EZ. Something makes sense. Get some continuity. So we're just going to rank the groups around the anchor A symmetric center. We're going to draw an arrow from 1 to 2 to 3, and the direction of that arrow is going to give us um, an indication of whether it's R or S. Now, here's the deal. The book says we draw an arrow 1 to 2 to 3, and that's going to tell us what's going on, assuming the fourth ranked group or lowest ranked group is pointed away. If it's not away, you're supposed to change the way you're looking at it. So change it so four is away. So this is what it's going to look like. This, this seems silly. Um, and it creates a certain dependence on a certain perspective, but every book uses it now. Um, so let's take a look at that. Let's say we've got got this. And let's just take, we know this is going to be Cairo, which has four unique groups around the central carbon. I'm going to do the mirror image really fast. So ethyl group goes as far away as possible. Methyl group stays up front close to the mirror and near us. Hydrogen up close to the mirror and away from us. So if we're going to rank these in terms of priority, which is our highest priority? Bromine, highest atomic number. I'm going to use different colors here. What's our second highest rank? The methyl or the ethyl? The ethyl. Because? Carbon. Because it has, yeah, hydrogen, 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 carbon. It's our two. Methyl is going to be our third because it is carbon instead of a hydrogen. And four is going to be there. Um, in this particular case, the reason they ask, or the author of the book, asks that the hydrogen point away from you, away from plane, is because this is using a steering wheel analogy. So if this is a steering wheel, and we're driving, this is a terrible steering wheel. I don't even can't draw a steering wheel. <laughs> we're going to pretend. So this is a steering wheel, and you have the steering wheel shaft thingy going to, into the car. I use the technical jargon for you guys. This bond here is our carbon to four bond. And the arrows we're drawing is indicative of the wheel because we'll have a one to two to three group or a one to two to three group. And if I have an arrow going this way, if I trace my hand along a wheel going this direction, I'm turning right. So it would be R. If the groups do this, one to two to three, 
and I turn the wheel this way, it's taking me left, which is S. This visualization of turning right or turning left only works if the carbon to fourth group bond is pointed away like you're holding on to a steering wheel and the bond is going away from you. This is where everyone's like, this seems like an awfully complex way to look at it. Um, and it can be, but it can also be really convenient. So in this particular case, the hydrogen is pointed away in plane. So if I was kind of looking at it from this angle, it makes sense. And I could draw an arrow from 1 to 2 to 3. And if I turn this way, which way am I going? Going to the left. Whereas here, we've got one, two, three, four, still going away, going this way, right. So because this fourth group just happens to be angled away, it's easy to use this as a model. Let's say. We've got something that looks like this. So we've got nearly the same thing, but we're going to flip this visually. And now the hydrogen's pointed right at us. What the book does is it says, just take these and switch them <laughs> and redraw it and then find out what it is and then flip it again. I'm not even, so don't worry, we're going to make it easier. This is what the book's saying, so I want to try to help rationalize what you guys have been reading. The way this is drawn, I'm just going to flip this. Be like, oh, I'm going to just arbitrarily change these two points. By doing this, it will change it from either R to S or S to R. By move, this will make it a non-superimposable mirror image. And then I can assign it one, two, three. Look at my arrows. This looks like it would be S, but I flipped this, so the original one was R. That seems like an awful lot of this is something that you can do pretty easily once you get it and you're good at it, but as a first step, I don't think that's really the best way to do it. What I think you guys should do, this is my recommendation, go back to the original. Is if you need to move something away, if you ever need to look at something from a different perspective on paper, you can always manipulate these tetrahedral structures by doing single bond rotations. So I have freedom of rotation around this bond and this bond and this bond. So I can take this whole thing and just turn it 120 degrees. And if I do that, I can just redraw the thing. I'm going to take this proton to this position, this methyl to this position, this ethyl where the proton was. So all I did was spin it along this axis. Sometimes you need to do another axis. I could spin it along this axis if we want to. Any of these axes are points of rotation. The trick is, is only do one axis at a time when you're redrawing. I think that this is a much simpler way versus doing a swap, calculating it, and then swapping from R or S back to S or R. That just doesn't jive with me. And if we were to look at it like this, we'd go one, two, three, R with the steering wheel. Now let's do the way that I do it. Wait, actually, let's have questions before we throw anything else at you guys. Because everyone's looking awfully consternated. 
I have some dilated pupils. I have some frustrated. A lot of this is happening. So why did you kind of go from one directly to two without the H? Is the H because the H is away. out of plane away from you. Away. Okay. Yeah, you always draw your circle when you're doing the steering wheel from one to two to three. And if it goes the direction that you would turn, steering wheel to turn, so this would be R. Okay. That's drawn. Okay. Yeah. No questions so far? Everyone's happy? We have one question. Okay. Just an observation. The, your method is very intuitive, and I don't know why the textbook lists the method that it does. I've never seen that approach in a book before. It works. The way it works. You can, yeah, because yeah, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm not, I'm not changing, it. changing it to something else. I am revisualizing it. I'm reorienting it so that the and hydrogen's pointed the away. Camera. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I don't know why. The trick, the reason is, is because a lot of people are intimidated by rotating 3D structures on paper. Yeah. Um, and until I learned the trick that you just pick a point to pivot and you do one pivot at a time. And this is really important skill to have though. And the reason is, is because it's not uncommon on like say an ACS organic chemistry for somebody to say, okay, let's say we've got, um, we'll say chlorine, bromine, iodine, methyl, and then we'll do this. Methyl, chlorine, iodine, bromine. Are these the same thing? Or are they are they a pair of enantiomers or are they the same thing drawn differently? Yeah, exactly. Ah! Right? So the easiest way to approach it, there's two ways to do it. One, I can move the methyl so that it's like this. So I'll leave the bromine up here. The chlorine moves to the iodine, the iodine moves here. So methyls are aligned, carbons aligned, and then what I have to do, and iodine's aligned, and you see, so I've got three things aligned, and two things that aren't, which means the way I randomly drew these are not superimposable, because if I tried to align something else, it would pull one of these other two out. So you can just redraw it so that you can have two things aligned and see if the uh, three of the uh, the central and two are aligned, and if the other two aren't, then it's not the same thing. Or you can just say, which one's R? Is this R? Is this R? Is this R? Or is this S? If they're both R, they're the same. If they're both S, the same. If one is R and one is S, they're different. So there's two different ways you can do it. One leans on just assigning R and S to both. One's a redraw. Um, and they're both valid. Now. So there's no shame in drawing one rotation at a time and having your second. Absolutely place. not. Because you're never going to need more than two. Could you draw one like that? Like where you do them separately? Where I just yeah. look at R and S individually? Yeah. Yeah. So I can't remember what I just erased. I think methyl. It was just methyl. Methyl there and, and iodine. iodine here. Okay. So who knows their halogens? Which one's the biggest? Iodine, second biggest, bromine, chlorine, methyl. So in this particular case, I'm going to, I'd have to rotate it so that this group is over here. Um, but instead, I'm going to cheat. <coughs> this is S. And this one is, let's see here, one, two, three, four. Um, this one is, right. So you would know that these are a pair of enantiomers and they're not the same thing. Um, what I just did with my hand was what I do most of the time. And this is really fun and it's not in the book, and it's fun to watch people do tests with this trick. But there's a way that you can do this without actually having to redraw anything, and it's just using your hand. Because I was using our hand, hands as chiral objects. They're all connected the same way, but the, your image is not superimposable. We even refer to it as handedness. We have left and right. 
R and S. If you make your thumb the bond between the carbon and the lowest priority compound, the four, so this is the carbon to four bond, and this is the arrow going this way. Let me clean this up a little bit. We can do a proof of concept on it with the hydrogen going over <coughs> us. What I can do is I can point my thumb into plane like this, and if my finger acts like the arrow, because it's my left hand, it's S. Point my thumb, carbon to four bond, trace one to two to three, if it follows the arrow, it's R. The cool thing about this is the fourth group can be up in the air. Does it go one, two, three, or does it go one, two, three? It can be pointed towards you, like this case. Here, I can point my thumb like this, and I can say, like this, one, two, three. Or this way, right at me, one, two, three. So I use my hand, and just get the hang of it, run it both ways, practice both. If I, I don't do, the, the only time I don't use the handed technique is if the hydrogen or low group just happens to be pointed away. If it happens to be pointed away, I do the steering wheel, because I draw the circle and it's there for you. If the hydrogen is pointed towards me, I'm always going to be pointing my thumb right at me and just going with it. If the hydrogen is up, it's super easy to go with it. So. I recommend people try both ways um, and get your preference. And if I was taking a test and I want to make sure I'm right, um, assuming that you've prioritized everything correctly, which I'm sure you will because it's pretty straightforward to prioritize, you can do both and compare them to make sure they agree and you have a double check. Yeah? On this one on the left, when you were doing it, uh, how does that work? Yeah, we um, saw you like limbo that. and it was confusing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to... So this is in plane, like this. So this is my right hand. right? Oh, you guys are with me now. So one, this would go one to three if I did this. Or three to two. It's going the wrong way. Okay, so that's how you... Can right? It. It's hard for me to turn my hand like this. But there we go. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have, I have like two major shoulder. I can't not flexible anymore. Actually. Oh. But. Oh. Everyone okay? I didn't. I didn't tear anything off. Don't worry. It's all. It's all still there. Cool. Yeah. Can you show an example of redrawing where the lowest priority group is in that? Yeah. So let's say we'll just put that as a hydrogen to make sure that it's nice and low priority. We'll have a methyl, an ethyl, and a propyl. So this will be four. Which ones are highest priority? Propyl. Propyl. Ethyl. Methyl. So if we were to draw the arrow, we're going to know right out the gate this is R. Because if we just make our thumb and we go 1 to 2 to 3, it's tracing this circle. If we want to redraw it, oh wait. I drew it like that. You want me to redraw it? Draw it in the steering wheel. Oh, draw it to the steering wheel? OK. Gotcha. So to draw it to steering wheel in this case, yeah. I want to put this hydrogen down here. So what I'll probably do is rotate around this bond so that this hydrogen rotates to this position. This methyl rotates to this position. This ethyl, the propyl, rotates up where the hydrogen was, and I'm going to leave the ethyl group here. So 
So methyl goes over here. F propyl goes up here. Hydrogen goes back here. One, two, three, still R. And the more you do, this is one of those scenarios where if this is really hard to see when it's flat, get a kit and connect four different colors to a central carbon so you can just take it and spin it around and look at it from different angles and get a hang of what's <laughs> happening when you're rotating things. Um, it's a lifesaver. And you can bring your kit to an exam. The caveat to that is, if you go building things during an exam, it's going to chew up a lot of time. So if you're stuck on one thing, it can save you. If you're using it for everything, you're going to have a hard time finishing. Yeah? Do you know what those kits are called specifically? For molecular modeling kits. They're on Amazon for like 17 dollars. Yeah. And they come from very simple to incredibly complex. But we don't need any of the super complex stuff for this. Any other questions? So I know it takes a little bit of practice. Jump in, get some practice on these, um, assigning things R and S. Because down the road, I think probably, are we going to introduce it this today? We may get to multiple stereo centers today. Um, <clears throat> we might. But lots of compounds have two, three, five, six chiral carbons and therefore have two to the, if, if n is the number of chiral carbons, two to the n is the number of possible stereoisomers. So if you have something that has four chiral carbons in it, you have a potential two to the fourth, two, four, eight, sixteen stereoisomers for that particular Structure. Sorry, you said two to the n is the number of chiral stereoisomers. Yeah, so n is the number of asymmetric centers or chiral carbons in, is our most common, but yeah, asymmetric centers in general. Um, this would be the number of possible stereoisomers. Does a low pair count as one of the four different? Let's find out. <coughs> Let's put the A 180 degrees over here, so it's superimposed. Unusual though. It's unusual to have a tertiary nitrogen like that. When in doubt, draw the mirror image. See if you can superimpose it. Oh, oh, wait. Oh. We have to put the right spot. Oh uh, no! They're, they're, this is this this is actually I, that was that was a mean example, and the reason it's a mean example <clears throat> is because <clears throat> sorry. The answer should be. No, and I was trying to rationalize why it's no, having done this. Let me change it so that.
looks like this. Here's the deal. If it's tetrahedral, there's no way to invert it. I can take this structure, because it only has three bonds, and invert it. And then flip it, and then it's superimposable. This isn't a rigid structure. The cis trans is, happens because of rigidity around the ring or rigidity around the double bond. Oh, it's and when you have four bonds to the center, <laughs> you can't just take this and push these up here because this bond's in the way. But if you get rid of this bond and put in a lone pair, you can invert these structures. Don't worry, it won't be on the test. So the first example you drew is not superimposable. If you pushed it and inverted it, it would be. The way it was drawn, it wasn't superimposable. But if I inverted it and then flipped it over 180 degrees, it would be. Gotcha. Yeah. And that can invert the same way um, this can invert between different chair conformations. So it's just something flexing through space. OK. Fisher convention of drawing. So we've seen a lot of Fisher convention. I'm not going to go into as much detail as the book does. This book loves converting from Fisher to expanded and expanded to Fisher. Um, the convention here is that things that are oriented along this plane are down, this plane are up. So I could redraw this spatially. look like this. So now it has tetrahedral character. Because I typically draw things like this with two in plane. But if I were to take this in plane and tilt it up, these two groups would then be up, or start up, and these two groups would be down. Um, so it's just changing the way you look at it again. You don't see tetrahedral structures drawn like this very often, though. Um, the problem is with this is because these chains go like this, where you have one coming up and then one coming down, these will be up. And if they're on the same side, the only way for these to be on the same side, so this, let's say bromine is near side and hydrogen is away here, make this chlorine for ease, you would think Looking at this, chlorine would be on this side, but the way it's drawn tetrahedrally revolves flipping it 180 degrees, so chlorine ends up down here, and hydrogen goes there. Yeah. So it, it alternates. Because the only way to force everything up is to take these and rotate these 100 degrees so they're also up. But lowest energy goes in this tetrahedral zigzag. Okay, so the... the Fisher Convention's a pain. It just is. Um, and I wouldn't stress on this until you're better at visualizing these things three dimensionally. I would work on the RRS nomenclature and cis trans and the EZ. And then once those are comfortable, come back to this and it'll probably make a little bit more sense. So, would you say? Sorry. Go ahead. You had, you said you had two uh, 
of the same atom on the same side in the Fisher projection, they're going to be on, they're going to be like catty corner to each other. Like this? In, in the chain. Yeah. Um, so, so like the when I draw it free, I'm going to use these tetrahedral okay, yeah. orientations like this. And because there's freedom of rotation here, I can take this and spin this 180 degrees. And when I do that, it's going to look like because this was a way, and when I spun it 180 degrees, it ended up near side. OK, so the Fisher projections are all drawn in the right-hand side conformation, basically. Yeah, with like everything up okay. and everything down. OK. Because this is, if drawn tetrahedrally, is now down. OK. Yeah. Why, why, it's, why do the Fisher projections when you can just do it for spin? Because when you're drawing carbohydrates, drawing it with full structure uh, gets onerous really fast. When you have six, eight carbons, it gets it gets pretty nasty pretty quickly. And we want to be able to draw. It, it, so let's say we want to draw something that looks like this, and we want to do a mirror image of it. This is very simple to draw a mirror image because you just take near side, far side. Changing one group, very easy. Drawing the whole thing out gets complex pretty quickly. So and we the we probably we won't be using a lot of advanced Fisher in this class. We're gonna be mostly doing structural. And then when you guys hit biochem two and you're in carbohydrates, Fisher's gonna come back. So like I guess this book leans on the Fisher projection more than other books I've seen before. Oh, I had a question back here first. Yeah, they were rotating that thing 90 degrees. Did you left to right? Fisher? Hmm? Um, if you rotated that uh, Fisher 90 degrees. This way? Yeah. Are you reading it left to right or right to left? Oh, the other convention of Fisher is that the parent chain is almost always arranged vertically, and the top is your one carbon. Wait, the top is the smallest carbon? Um, no, in the parent chain numbering system. Oh, okay. So that's your, your reference for how you would set it up. Yeah. So the horizontal is always up and then the yeah. vertical. Up at you. It's starting to feel like Oakham yet, guys? Just a little bit? OK. This book loves optical activity. Who's read the optical activity portion of the text so far? A couple people. OK, so what optical activity is, is I might just get, get to the point. Chiral compounds are optically active. What this means is that if you put plain polarized light through a sample of a pure chiral compound, it will rotate plain polarized light. It will rotate in a certain direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise, and it will rotate a certain magnitude in terms of degrees. We refer to this as, you've probably seen this before, D and L. Small d, small l, specifically big D. Big L means something totally different and unrelated. Um, so small d, small l. This is dextrorotary and levorotary. Um, Extra rotary. This is also, you see, this is plus minus. These are all ways of referring to the degree, the, the, the optical rotation. So, the thing about this that's important 
that I want you guys to take away is I don't I you'll notice I didn't assign much in the way of calculating percent enrichment of a stereoisomer or wanting you guys to get into the nitty-gritty of actual polarization of compounds. There's a couple concepts I want you do to take away though. First off, whether something is R or S has no bearing at all on if it's D or L. Some R compounds will be dextrorotary, some R compounds will be levorotary. A really good example of this is lactic acid. Which is, this is S lactic acid, which has positive rotation. However, if we put this in a base of sodium hydroxide and remove this proton and pair it with sodium counter ion, and it becomes sodium lactate. It is still S, but now it rotates plain polarized light the opposite direction. There's absolutely no structural cue that you can look at which is going to give you predictive power over whether or not something's plus or minus D or L. It has to be physically measured. Um, now, the other thing about this that's really important is if you have a pair of enantiomers, one will rotate it light one way, the other will rotate it the other way. The magnitude of that rotation will be the same, however. So let's say arbitrarily this one is R and this one is S. This R rotates it this way, 23 degrees. The S will give it 23 degrees in the opposite direction. If you have an equal mixture of R and S to mixed together and you put it in the polarimeter, you will have no net change. Even though you have an optically active species here and an optically active species here, combined together, they will have a cancellation effect. And this is called a racemic mixture. A racemic mixture is a 50-50 mix of your two different enantiomers. Now, there are times during synthetic reactions where you don't have quite a 50-50 mixture. And this is when you have what's called um, enantiomeric excess. <coughs> and the degree of excess can be calculated using an equation in the book if you need to, as long as you know what a pure version of it does in terms of its optical rotation. It's a fairly straightforward ratio-based equation. Um, once again, on my list of priorities, not high. I'd much rather people get proficient at labeling things R and S, cis, trans, E and Z, and rotating compounds, because you will be doing that for the rest of OCHEM 1 and OCHEM 2, and the optical rotation stuff is less critical. Um, we will pick this up on Wednesday with compounds with more than one asymmetric center.